And he had actually been offered um, the presidency of that bank and turned it down. Okay. Now, on the other hand, uh, Mark Thornton has done some research on um, what American economists were saying. Okay. I mean, all the way to the 20s, you can look back at, at the, the, the writings of the Austrians, and, and they were saying that there was going to be a recession. The most you can do when you have an inflation is to postpone the recession. Okay? You can never abolish the recession. But Irving Fisher, this is uh, September 5th, who was really the father of monetarism. Uh, this is September 5th, 1929. He said, uh, there may be a recession in stock prices, but not anything in the nature of a crash. Okay, this is a month before uh, stocks lost 90% of their value. He says, dividend returns on stocks are moving higher. This is not due to receding prices for stocks and will not be hastened by any anticipated crash, the possibility of which I fail to see. Okay, so he, he, he didn't see any crash. Stock prices had stopped rising that August, okay, and people were starting to get worried. Um, now, after stocks, even after stocks started to fall in value, Fisher stated on October 16, 1929, um, that stocks had reached a permanently high plateau, okay, because they had stopped rising, but he claimed that on a permanent plateau they were going to stay high, and that he expected, quote, to see the stock market a good deal higher than it is today within a few months, okay. And that in any case, he did not, quote, feel that there will uh, soon, if ever, be a 50 or 60 point break below present levels. Okay. However, on, on October 22nd, he was quoted as saying that he believed the breaks of the last few days, now that it had started to break in October, the stock market, the breaks in the last few days have driven stocks down to hard rock, meaning that that 50 point drop, you know, it's not going to fall any more than that. I believe that we will have a ragged market for a few weeks, only a few weeks, and then the beginning of a mild bull market, bull movement, will gain momentum next year. However, on October 24th, he was quoted as saying that if it's true that $15 billion in stock quotation losses have been suffered in the present break, I have no hesitation in saying values are too low. So now he's claiming the stocks had fallen too far, okay? And we still didn't have the great crash. And yet, once again, on the next day, the New York Times reported the worst stock crash with nearly 13 million shares swamping the market. Then less than a week later, on October 28th and 29th, the Dow Jones Industrial uh, Average plummeted with a 70-point break and a two-day loss of almost 25%. Stock market lost one-third of its value during 1929, and on November 3rd, Fisher was quoted as saying that st stock prices were absurdly low. He had better have been telling that to his wife because he lost her whole fortune in this, okay? He did. He mar married a very rich woman. Um, economists tend to do that. Some famous economists have married very rich women, okay? They're not an economist for no reason. All right, so, however, stocks, <laughs> stocks had much further to fall, and in the two years following his predictions, the Dow Jones lost almost 90% of its peak value, and the market value of the leading investment trusts lost 95% of their market value, Okay? So, so much for um, the age of perpetual prosperity, right? By the way, um, he wrote a book explaining what had happened uh, uh, in 1932, so he's looking back now, and he still couldn't get it through his head that his policy in the that he advocated in the 1920s was, was the cause of all of this. He says, as this book goes to press, recovery seems to be in sight. Okay, this is 1932, of course, we didn't recover until World War II. In the course of about two months, stocks have nearly doubled in price and commodities have risen 5.5%. Um, so he, he was still claiming, maybe to appease his wife, that you know, recovery was just around the corner. Okay. But the Austrians, uh, Mises, Hayek, uh, and, and other Austrians, um, saw this as it properly was, in fact, a readjustment, and, and Mises went on to say when he, he wrote something in 1932, um, his point was that unless you stopped trying to, 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 make, uh, to, to prevent prices from falling and, and stopped introducing cartels into the economy and, uh, and propping up unions and so on, uh, this was going to go on. And it was not a normal recession. In fact, it was a crisis of, of interventionism, okay? that, of, that is, of government intervention into the economy that made the economy inflexible and unable to re readjust. Okay. All right, I will stop there and take any questions that you may have. Yes? Uh, it seems to me one of the basic problems is our measure of inflation in the consumer price index is a very poor measure. How can we bring in, and this happened in your 20s and again uh, in the 90s. Right. How 
often we bring in what happens uh, to real estate going up and uh, stocks going up. How can we incorporate that with the CPI so we have a much better measure of uh, inflation? Yeah, I'm very suspicious of very large indexes that try to incorporate everything, okay? I think if you want to look at, you know, if there's infl inflation of prices, you know, you just look at things like bread and newspapers, things that don't change much in quality. But even better, um, I think you have to look at the money supply. And we're not doing that now, right? Since Green Greenspan claimed that we can't measure the money supply back in the late 80s. And even if we could, we can't control it, meaning we, the Fed. Now, why the heck is he the Fed chairman if he's, he's saying these types of things? Yeah, absolutely. The broadest measure of the money supply was. Yeah, they 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 stopped they stopped um, um, announcing what what M three was. However, the St. Louis Fed you can find that information on their on their uh, web website, St. Louis Fe Federal Reserve uh, Bank. Um, but once again, the, the key point here is that whenever you increase the money supply, okay, and um, regardless of what happens to consumer prices you are causing distortions in the interest rate. And that sooner or later, those distortions are going to cause entrepreneurs to make errors. Entrepreneurs that previously were doing very well. And all of a sudden, why would all these entrepreneurs cause this, uh, uh, engage in a cluster of errors in which many, many firms go bankrupt and have to cut back and fire and, uh, and lay off workers and so on? The only, what, what's the explanation? Did all the entrepreneurs become stupid at once? No, they were misled. Their monetary calculations, their calculations of profits and losses were misled by the inflation of the, of the money supply. Okay. Somebody else? Yes, and then you. If governmental manipulation of the interest rate explains booms and busts, mm -hmm. how do you explain the horrific booms and busts in the history of the United States before mm -hmm. the founding of the Federal Reserve in 1913? They weren't necessarily as horrific as, uh, as, um, as they have been made out to be. There's been, been actual work by um, mainstream economists that point out that you know, the data wasn't as good back then and, and they, they look worse than they really were. But there were. There were. The, the key there is that there still was fractional reserve banking and, and that, that these banks did expand to, and, and, and did increase the money supply, and then, um, but, but, but they, they tended to be shorter. Okay? And the banks would meet, and, and you, the recessions would be shorter because the, the, no one propped up the banks. The banks uh, and kept the money supply growing. Okay, so that's why they tended to be to be shorter. And we had flexibility of wages and prices. The deflation was more serious. The deflation was more serious. Yes. Yeah, it was yeah. Shorter, but quicker. Very sharp. Very very sharp. In the 1830s, we had one that was extremely sharp. But what happened was that it was quickly over. It was during Jackson's. Um, presidency. And um, it was interesting, the, the, even during that period, consumption was still growing. Okay. Uh, why? Because prices were able to adjust very, very quickly. Yes? Uh, this is a two-part question. Sure. Uh, first of all, does the national debt include um, money that's owed to the Federal Reserve for the bonds that they hold? And if so, what would happen if the federal government repudiated just the portion of the national debt owed Okay, the question is, um, does the national debt include the um, portion of bonds that have been sold to the um, Federal Reserve? Well, first of all, the Treasury is not allowed to sell bonds by law directly to the Federal Reserve. Okay, so the Federal Reserve does not buy bonds from the government directly. It buys it from you and I. Okay, but so yes, it's, it's a when, when those bonds are issued, it's certainly counted as part of the national debt. But to answer the second part of your question, what happens is that when the uh, Fed um, receives the interest on the, the national debt from the Treasury, it rebates most of that interest back to the Treasury. It's just an accounting fiction. Okay? It keeps some of it. It keeps a, you know, a part of it. But most of it is rebated. Okay? So the interest is never paid to the, to the Fed for the most part. Okay? Okay. It's rebated back to the Treasury. Um, I, don't, I don't know the exact details. Detailed, I, I suspect it's simply just an accounting operation. So, so, for all practical purposes, that debt doesn't really exist because there's no interest on it? In, in the sense that, yeah, it, you know, it's really um, owned by another branch of the government, despite the fact that the, the Fed claims that it's uh, independent of, of, 